In February of 2023, at the time of the world-famous carnival celebrations in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, a costumed man was arrested for harassing people. A photo that circulated in the media showed an officer of the military police as he detained a man dressed in a giant phallic costume, only the man's face bearing a glum expression and his flip-flop wearing feet were visible from the seven-foot manhood costume. Local media reported that the man had been chasing women taking part in the parades. The situation's ridiculousness was not lost on the arresting officer as he was pictured seemingly holding back a smile while restraining the suspect by the arms. Among the netizens commented on the incident, one Twitter user quipped that the arrest represented a hard reality. Number 7. Callie Elizabeth Thweet In May of 2023, a woman was arrested for sneaking into a Georgia restaurant and making herself a $500 salad. 23-year-old Callie Elizabeth Thweet entered the closed Harvest Moon Cafe in Floyd County and began rummaging through its food coolers. While making the salad, she touched several ingredients with her bare hands, which amounted to hundreds of dollars in damages as the restaurant had to throw away the products. The police didn't disclose what food items Thweet had used in making her salad. The young woman, who was seen smiling in her mugshot, was charged with misdemeanor theft by taking. Number 6. Edward Matthews A New Jersey man was sentenced to eight years in prison in December of 2023 following multiple reports of him using racially charged language and displaying threatening behavior against the black neighbors in his Mount Laurel community. In July of 2021, Edward Matthews was involved in a dispute with his Condo Complexes Homeowners Association. Matthews, who was at the time in his mid-40s, was recorded getting in his black neighbor's face and bumping his chest. He spat on the man during a vitriolic tirade in which he called him the N-word and a monkey. While visibly frustrated, the victim refused to engage him, keeping his arms outstretched in a manner suggesting he had no violent intentions. Matthews, who worked as a construction foreman, then told bystanders to come see him and gave out his address. The video of the altercation went viral and hundreds of protesters surrounded Matthews' town home, chanting his name and calling for his arrest. On July the 5th of 2021, roughly a dozen law enforcement officers arrived at the address and rushed to escort Matthews to a police vehicle through an angry crowd that threw various items at him. The investigation into the man's behavior began as a harassment complaint but it emerged that he'd threatened other residents and used racist language towards them for years. He frequently called his neighbor monkeys, shot their cars and windows with BB guns, smeared dog feces on their property, in addition to sending them threatening letters and emails. He eventually pleaded guilty to four counts of bias intimidation as well as possession of a controlled, dangerous substance with intent to distribute. Four victim impact statements from current or former Mount Laurel Condominium Association residents were read in court prior to his sentencing. Former neighbor Denise Brown said, the actions of what he did will forever stay a nightmare of the fear and anxiety he bestowed upon me. Matthews apologized in court while shackled and handcuffed, saying that he was committed to rebuild the community and that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Number 5. Anna Lushchinskaya In December of 2018, Anna Lushchinskaya, aged 40, was aboard the D-train in Brooklyn, New York City, when she launched a random and racially charged attack at a fellow rider. Suddenly and without provocation, Lushchinskaya began yelling at an Asian woman and telling her to F off as she was standing next to her. Sometime later, Lushchinskaya started kicking the woman, who promptly fought back. Strap hangers intervened with one of them telling Lushchinskaya, Lady, obviously you have problems. Lushchinskaya proceeded to hit the other woman with her umbrella and her keys before showing her the middle finger and calling her a racial slur. 
The attack triggered reactions of outrage from other riders, including 31-year-old Juan Ayala, who'd been recording Lushchinskaya. As tensions escalated, the latter spat at Ayala and called him Mohammed, but he counteracted her vitriol by telling her that he was Dominican. She then ripped out his headphones and hit the phone out of his hand. The video cut off seconds after Ayala grabbed Lushkinskaya and threw her on the ground. A photo that he'd later posted to Twitter showed him holding the raging woman on the platform with the caption, She tried me so I had to detain her until the cops showed up. He suffered minor injuries in the altercation, while the Asian woman that Lushchinskaya had randomly attacked was left with bleeding cuts to her face. Lushchinskaya was arrested on charges of felony assault, but pleaded guilty in November of 2020 to the lesser charge of second-degree menacing, for which she was given two years of probation and one day in an anger management class. Number 4. Elwood Gutchell Two days after St. Patrick's Day, on March the 19th of 2017, Pennsylvania man Elwood Gutchell was stopped by law enforcement near his Newville home. The 44-year-old man had committed multiple traffic violations and officers suspected he was at a level of intoxication that prevented him from safely operating a motor vehicle. A blood alcohol test revealed that he was nearly three times the legal limit. Gutchell was arrested for DUI and other traffic offenses. His appearance at the time of the arrest was in tune with the recent celebrations and rather ironic given his charges. Gutchell was shown in his mugshot wearing a green t-shirt that read Drunk Lives Matter and also featured the symbol of a shamrock. Gutchell had several prior arrests on his record including several DUIs and a 2009 assault to which he'd pleaded guilty. Number 3. John Reeb Ohio realtor John Reeb was arrested several times over the summer of 2023 for incidents in which he displayed threatening behavior. One conflict, which occurred on a golf course, was recorded and went viral on TikTok. It began after an unnamed woman had hit a ball in Reeb's vicinity. She and her friends drove to the spot so that she could hit it again, but 41-year-old Reeb, who was wearing a green polo and khaki shorts, took the ball and refused to give it back. The ball was reportedly special to the woman who struck it and she asked for Reeb to return it. The viral video commenced with him arguing with the other golfers and eventually trying to goad one of them into a physical altercation. The other man made it clear that he wasn't about to fight on a golf course, which triggered a wild reaction out of Reeb. He took his t-shirt off and began flexing his muscles while screaming, You see that? That's a dude that's been to heaven. You want to test God? He then dared the others to come get it. One of the golfers was heard saying that Reeb was mentally ill before she and the others drove off in their cart. As they did so, Reeb was recorded telling bystanders, Been to heaven, leave me alone. Some social media users described his reaction as going full Hulk, while others labeled him the golf course Karen. Reeb had a history of problems with the law, some of which had occurred earlier that summer and involved similar antisocial outbursts. At around 1.15 a.m. on July the 29th, Police responded to reports of a shirtless Reeb chasing down a woman who was driving a car in his neighborhood. He was charged with menacing and obstructing official business after he'd refused to answer his door to officers who'd gone to question him. On July the 26th, he was charged with disorderly conduct for threatening his 26-year-old neighbor, Christian William Greitman, while only wearing his underwear. On July the 15th, the arch-bold man was again charged with disorderly conduct for yelling at resident Keith Perry as he was getting in his truck to drive to work. During the incident, Reeves spat at the truck and also tried to spit on Perry through the vehicle's open window. Other notable incidents in Reeves' checkered legal past included him being arrested for planning a riot in 2022 and running through a stop sign in 2020 which resulted in him crashing into a Ford pickup truck and flipping his Buick minivan. He was seriously injured and there was some suspicion that his heightened aggression was linked to the lingering trauma he'd suffered in the crash. 
Today's topic was inspired by Clara McCohen. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Dominic Santana Former US President Donald Trump traveled to Miami in the summer of 2023, where he was being arraigned on 37 federal counts that stemmed from his alleged mishandling of classified documents. Trump, who pleaded not guilty to his charges, left the Wilkie D. Ferguson Jr. United States Federal Courthouse in a motorcade after an hour-long hearing. He was also accompanied by his Secret Service detail. Local authorities had shut off a block in the area of the courthouse where protesters and supporters of the former president had gathered. Local, state and federal authorities were present in riot gear to control the crowd. Barriers and police tape were also used towards that end, in addition to helicopters carrying out surveillance overhead. Throughout the former president's hearing, 61-year-old Dominic Santana stood outside the courthouse wearing a striped prisoner's costume and holding a sign that read, Lock him up. He was at one point pictured arguing with a Trump supporter. Then as Trump's motorcade was in motion, photos and videos taken at the scene showed Santana running in front of one of the official cars while still holding his sign. Officers from the Miami City Police Department quickly intervened and took control of Santana, but chaos ensued as others began running after the former president's vehicle before it sped away to safety. Subsequent photos taken at the scene showed Santana surrounded by officers and a crowd of bystanders while he was sitting on the sidewalk with his hands handcuffed behind his back. It wasn't made immediately clear if Santana was charged with anything but he made his position on Trump clear while speaking to the Miami Herald saying he got away with it and enough is enough with all the lies. He should be locked up. For those of you who enjoyed learning about all this public debauchery, hang tight because we've got a huge lineup for you about when partying goes wrong. Coming up right after number one. Number one, Davina Singh. On November the 4th of 2020, dozens of anti-cop protesters were arrested in New York City's West Village neighborhood after a number of incidents that included them lighting garbage cans on fire and clashing with local law enforcement. One moment that would be highlighted in the media was a confrontation between 24-year-old NYU graduate Davina Singh and Sergeant Joshua Gregory of the NYPD. Even though the city was in the midst of dealing with the coronavirus pandemic, Singh was recorded by a New York Post reporter without a face mask while screaming in Gregory's face, cursing at him and calling him a fascist. The Shrenksville, Pennsylvania resident then repeatedly spat in the cop's face. In the moments that followed, Gregory grabbed her by the shoulders and took her into custody, aided by his colleagues. Singh had to be carried to a prisoner transport van by two cops as she reportedly went completely limp and dropped her body to the ground. In the incident's wake, the New York Post ran a story headlined, Flem Fatale, that showed the protester exactly as she was in the process of spitting on the cop. The woman, who was pictured wide-eyed in her mugshot and with a face mask under her chin, was charged with obstruction of governmental administration, harassment, and resisting arrest. She had previously been arrested in September during anti-ICE protests in Manhattan after she'd reportedly jumped on the back of an NYPD captain. During that incident, Singh was also charged with obstruction and resisting arrest. Number 7. Millie Taplin In August of 2021, British teenager Millie Taplin and her friends went out in Southend, Essex to celebrate the lifting of lockdown restrictions. It was reportedly Taplin's first night out to the club, as her 18th birthday, which she'd celebrated the previous November, had been marked by a quiet meal at home with her family. She and her companions had cocktails at a local pub before making their way to a club called Moo Moo's. During the course of the evening, Taplin began talking to a young man on the dance floor and reportedly accepted a drink from him. Before long, she started feeling sick and went outside, whereupon 
she began experiencing blurry vision. Her speech became slurred and she had trouble standing up right. Her friends got so worried that they called Taplin's sister, 28-year-old Sadie, who arrived at the scene and rushed her to the emergency room. It was there that they were later joined by Claire, Taplin's mother. Talking to a media outlet, the 48-year-old woman compared the state in which she'd found her daughter to a scene from The Exorcist. Claire reported her hands were clawed, her jaw was clenched, and her face was so distorted she looked possessed. It was determined that Taplin's drink had been spiked, although the exact substance remained unclear. With MDMA, or ecstasy derivatives, being named as the likeliest drugs based on her symptoms. Claire filmed her daughter's horrific reaction to the drugs with the intention of subsequently showing her the video as a warning for her to be more careful in the future. Once Taplin recovered a few hours later, she urged her mother to post the footage to a Crime Watch Facebook group, hoping it would serve as a cautionary example for parents and other young people. The video of her horrifically contorted face and body went viral. Some commenters argued that Taplin had intentionally taken the drugs that caused the paralyzing reaction, but she vehemently denied ever doing so, an assertion wholly supported by her family. Number 6. Alexei Ponomarev A patron at a bar in southwestern Siberia, Russia, was left with horrific burns in May of 2013, following a stunt in which a bartender poured a glass of flaming absinthe into his mouth. 28-year-old Alexei Ponomarev's girlfriend, Anfisa Krilova, began filming the bar trick at an unspecified establishment in Novosibirsk. The bartender ignited the drink as Ponomarev laid his head back on the counter. As the blazing liquid began cascading, bright blue flames engulfed the man's face. Krilova was heard screaming in the background before the footage, which was subsequently shared thousands of times online, cut off. Ponomarev was rushed to the hospital with first and second degree burns to his face and ear. He subsequently stated an intention of suing the establishment for half a million rubles, which amounted to over $14,000. Bartender Albert Baikov, aged 34, claimed that it was Ponomarev who'd asked he use absinthe instead of the usual Sambuca and added that the customer bore responsibility for the failed trick because he'd covered his mouth. Number 5. Kim Pham In November of 2014, two women were sentenced to six years each in a state prison at Orange County Superior Court after they'd beaten 23-year-old Kim Pham to death outside an establishment in Santa Ana, California. The incident occurred on January the 19th of that same year at a bar and club which at the time was known as the Crosby. Candace Brito and Vanessa Zavala, aged 27 and 26 respectively, were outside when an acquaintance of theirs only identified as Amelia bumped into Pham as she was taking a photo with her friends. A verbal fight erupted between the two women prompting Brito and Savela to intervene on Amelia's behalf. It was reported that Pham had thrown the first punch, igniting a brawl that was captured on a bystander's cell phone and later presented as evidence in court. In the course of the melee, Pham was knocked to the ground, at which point Brito and mother of one, Zavala, repeatedly kicked her in the head. She sustained brain damage and was taken off life support two days later, with the cause of death reported to have been complications from blunt force trauma. Only Brito and Zavala were charged in the case, and during their court proceedings, they initially claimed to have acted in self-defense, but were ultimately convicted of voluntary manslaughter and assault. A judge would point out that the two law-abiding, nice young women weren't gangsters or fighters and that they'd had every opportunity to swallow their pride and walk away, but instead chose to brutally attack Pham. Number 4. Tiger Tiger Incident On December the 7th of 2021, patrons at an establishment called Tiger Tiger in central London were left vomiting and bleeding from their mouths in an incident that was initially feared to have been an organized attack. A group of five club goers, the identities of whom weren't released, had downed tequila shots and used salt and lemon to soften the taste. Not long afterwards, they began to painfully retch and spit out blood. Police and ambulance vehicles raced to the Tiger Tiger as panic had overtaken the club with patrons fearing it was under a biological attack. The authorities placed the club on lockdown, but it soon emerged that the incident had been the result of an accident, stemming from staff keeping caustic soda and salt in similar containers. When the group downed the shots, they'd actually touched a corrosive cleaning chemical, which causes burns in contact with skin. 
Because of its effectiveness in decomposing proteins, the substance, also known as sodium hydroxide, is also used to dissolve animal remains, particularly roadkill. The injuries the club goers had sustained weren't reported as life-threatening, although one of them still required hospital treatment over a month after the incident. Number 3. Tenerife Club Dance Floor Collapse Dozens of revelers were injured at a night spot in Tenerife in November of 2017 after a stage in part of the dance floor collapsed. Footage of the incident would show a performer singing and dancing on stage. At around 2.30 a.m. at the Butterfly Disco Pub, moments later screams echoed through the establishment as the floor covering an area of approximately 43 square feet gave way, sending the performer and other club goers plummeted into the basement. The lower level, normally operated as a bingo, was fortunately unoccupied at the time. After plummeting an estimated 10 feet, revelers were extracted from the rubble with various injuries, none of which were described as life-threatening. Those most seriously hurt reported broken legs, ankles or hips. Eight ambulances had been dispatched to the scene on the main strip, Avenida Rafael Puig Juvina, in the municipality of Adej. 22 people were taken to the hospital, including British, Spanish, Romanian, French and Belgian nationals. An investigation was launched into the incident. As of the latest updates on the matter, British couple Brian Young and Kevin Dilworth, both in their late 50s, initiated legal action against a butterfly. The former had shattered his ankle and suffered from depression in the aftermath, while the latter had sustained ligament damage. Number 2. Marko Gubarovic in May of 2021, a man from New Jersey was killed following an argument at a gentleman's club made famous by the HBO series The Sopranos. 38-year-old Marko Gubarovic had gotten into a fight with other patrons at Satin Dolls in Lodi, which was known as Bada Bing, on the aforementioned TV series. As the conflict spilled outside, shortly before 4 a.m., a group of five men beat Gubarovic into unconsciousness and abandoned him in the middle of the highly circulated Route 17. Moments after the assailants had fled the scene, a driver who wasn't identified sped down the road in the 2020 BMW M8 and failed to notice Gubarovic. The man was fatally struck and his body was gruesomely mangled after being dragged under the vehicle for approximately 600 feet. Kevin Aguadelo, Christian Reyes and Julio Peña were arrested alongside brothers Adrian Hotti and Ferro Hotti. The suspects, all in their early to mid-twenties, were identified through surveillance footage and witness testimonies. The authorities determined they displayed extreme indifference to human life and each faced charges of aggravated manslaughter and endangering an injured victim. Number 1. Rampage of Muhammad Abdul In March of 2018, a club goer was arrested and charged with attempted murder after plowing his Suzuki Vitara into a crowd at a marquee area of Blake's nightclub in Gravesend, Kent, England. Most of those in attendance had gathered for a performance by grime artist Giggs. 21-year-old Mohammed Abdul was kicked out by bouncers because he'd become too intoxicated on the dance floor. He'd allegedly told them as he was being ejected, I'm going to come back and shut this place down and kill you guys. Abdul had reportedly smoked cannabis and drank tequila shots, in addition to up to 15 vodka mixes. He got in his vehicle, for which he only had a provisional license, and maneuvered into a narrow alleyway at the side of the club. Abdul then accelerated, crashed through closed metal gates and smashed into the revelers who were waiting for gigs on the dance floor. He'd done so even though they were unconnected to his dispute with the bouncers and merely enjoying a night out. The victims were reportedly sent sprawling like dominoes, and eight of them sustained injuries. Pierre Germain Joseph, who was at the venue to film gigs, was pinned by the Vitara and suffered a fractured shin bone and knee. 18-year-old Katie Wells went under the vehicle and was left with a fractured pelvis, bruising and tire marks on her thighs. Clubbers pulled Abdul out of the Vitara and detained him until police arrived at the scene. Prosecutors noted that Abdul had an obvious intent to kill in the revenge attack and he was eventually jailed for 28 years and banned from driving for 16 years. Number 8. Tom Miller In December of 2020, a student had recently signed his first professional rugby contract, suffered a fatal accident while attending a lockdown breaching house party in the Radford area of Nottingham, England. With pandemic restrictions limiting gatherings, panic overtook revelers 
when they were visited by community protection officers following up on a noise complaint. According to a Nottinghamshire police officer, the CPOs had just given them a warning and then left. Yet, as word spread among partygoers that the authorities were at the scene, a ripple effect ensued, with them fleeing into bedrooms, the garden, and other places where they could avoid potential detection. 24-year-old rugby player Tom Miller went upstairs, where he found a window that gave him access to a ledge and then a part of the roof. After reaching what he believed to be a safe haven, he filmed himself at the spot and invited one of his friends up to the roof with him. After they'd spent some time atop the building, the friend went to relieve himself but lost his footing. He and Miller somehow became entangled and suffered a fall from height. The friend sustained multiple injuries but survived, while Miller was left with a catastrophic brain injury from which he was unable to recover. Aside from closing in on his debut as a professional athlete, Miller was also an ambassador for the testicular cancer charity Oddballs. In the aftermath of his passing, over $60,000 were raised for the charity, following an online appeal in his name. Number 7. Aaron Lowe In September of 2021, a University of Utah football player was shot dead at a house party in Salt Lake City. Sophomore cornerback Aaron Lowe, age 21, was attending the party a few hours after his team, the Utes, had beaten Washington State. According to preliminary police reports, there was a dispute involving Lowe and a group of party crashers who were causing problems. Lowe was subsequently gunned down along with an unnamed 20-year-old woman. On October the 3rd, police chief Mike Brown tweeted out that Lowe's killer had been arrested. He was identified as Book Mawut Book, aged 22, a man whose lengthy criminal record included aggravated robbery, theft, weapons offenses, and giving false information to police. After retrieving a firearm from a shoulder bag, Book shot Lowe and the female victim several times. The pair collapsed to the ground, at which point Book approached them and fired five to six more rounds, which was later deemed as his attempt to finish them off. Lowe passed away from his injuries while the woman survived after undergoing extensive surgery. Book's sentence remained to be determined, but based on the charges, he was likely to face life in prison. Number 6. Nicholas Rogers on August the 6th of 2017, Nicholas Rogers stabbed a female postal worker to death at a house party in Pebbles, Scotland. After suffering from what was described as an abnormality of the mind, 26-year-old Rogers had been struggling with mental health issues, for which he'd spent time in specialized institutions, as well as with alcohol and gambling addiction. His then-girlfriend, 18-year-old Katrina Kelly, had been concerned about him in the days leading up to the fatal stabbing. They'd watched the movie Split together about a man with multiple personalities, the most menacing of which was a serial killer named The Beast. In the days that followed, Rogers asked that he only be referred to as The Beast and had sent Kelly a text message asking if she wanted to be sacrificed. The party was reportedly held in Cuddyside at the home of postal worker Alex Stewart, aged 22 whom Rogers stabbed in a fit of rage, inflicting extensive facial injuries. She was taken to Edinburgh Royal Infirmary where she passed away a few hours later. Rogers was arrested and admitted killing her, but denied intended murder, claiming he wasn't in the right state of mind. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 16 years served. Number 5. Demetrius Cox In April of 2020, a man was arrested for gunning down a guest at a house party in Osceola County, Florida. On the 14th, officers had responded to reports of shots fired at an address in Davenport, but couldn't find any victims. Law enforcement was later notified that Wolf Luther King Luma, aged 20, had been brought to Dr. Phillips Hospital in critical condition. A connection was made between the two reports, and the Osceola County Sheriff's Office determined that Luma had been shot at the party to which they'd initially responded. Luma later died from his injuries. Demetrius Cox, also aged 20, was subsequently arrested for the murder, and while the motive wasn't disclosed, the shooting is believed to have been gang-related. Osceola County Sheriff Ross Gibson warned that gang members were renting houses and hosting parties with numerous guests with the express intention of spreading COVID-19 among them in an arguably misguided attempt at generating herd immunity. The Sheriff's Office had received hundreds of complaints from residents whom Gibson stated were living a life of terror. Number 4. Nina Silva On June the 23rd of 2019, as she was on the verge of starting a new life in New York City, a San Diego woman was killed in a drive-by shooting while standing outside a house party 
in La Jolla. 19-year-old Nina Silva and three others were struck with a volley of rounds fired by the occupant of a light-colored sedan. An argument had sparked the shooting which occurred at around 12.30 a.m. Silva later passed away and another guest suffered life-threatening injuries to the upper body. Another victim was shot in the jaw while the fourth was treated for a gunshot wound to the arm. Two months after the shooting, 18-year-old Odyssey Sellers Carrillo was arrested as the suspected gunman following a high-speed pursuit with local authorities. Malik Joshua Campbell, then in his early 20s, was also charged for aiding and abetting Carrillo. Their trials are ongoing. Silver hadn't been the intended target in the shooting and was considered a tragic collateral casualty of an ongoing street gang rivalry. Number 3. Wyatt Tyler in March of 2017, a young man died in East Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York City, after falling four stories in a house party accident. According to his social media, Wyatt Tyler, age 21, was from New Orleans and going to NYU. He'd been drinking at the party, but it's unclear how severely it affected the chain of events that followed. The young man leaned against a window screen that couldn't support his weight and thus toppled out the window. As they first heard yelling and commotion, neighbors wanted to berate the party goers but soon realized the horrific accident that had taken place. First responders found Tyler sprawled on the pavement unconscious and unresponsive. He passed away a few hours later. His death wasn't treated as suspicious and while some reported that he wasn't intoxicated, the NYPD suspected that alcohol had contributed to the fatal fall. Number 2. Bobby Tillman In November of 2010, teenager Bobby Tillman was killed in a random act of violence at a house party in Douglas County, Georgia. Initially meant to be a small gathering of less than a dozen friends of a high school girl in the area, the party rapidly grew to an unruly crowd of nearly 100, as word spread via text and email. At some point, a brawl erupted in which a female party goer struck 19-year-old Emmanuel Boykins who, in turn, refrained from hitting her back but vowed to beat up the next male who walked by regardless of who he was. 18-year-old Tillman, who multiple sources stated hadn't been involved in the conflict in any sort of way, was savagely attacked as he approached Boykins and his companions. Four teenagers punched, kicked, and stomped on him repeatedly while dozens of bystanders watched but didn't intervene. Paramedics arrived at the scene and attempted CPR but unfortunately couldn't revive Tillman. Speaking to the media about the senseless attack, Major Tommy Wheeler of the Douglas County Sheriff's Department stated, they just decided he's the one and they killed him. Aside from Boykins, the other suspects were identified as 18-year-olds Quantes Mallory and Horace Coleman, along with Trace and Franklin aged 19. There was a considerable degree of community outrage in the aftermath sparked by the random and horrific nature of Tillman's killing. Boykins pleaded guilty under an agreement that enabled him to be granted parole after 30 years served in prison, while the other attackers were all sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Number 1. Fatal Stoning in Fort Worth In July of 2021, a house party in Fort Worth, Texas descended into chaos resulting in a fatal shooting as well as a deadly instance of mob justice. The identities of those involved weren't disclosed by the authorities pending the completion of an investigation. Of the information that was released, it was reported that the small gathering had taken place in the neighborhood of Como at the home of Ashley Jimenez Santos. At around 1 a.m., a man showed up at the residence uninvited and started arguing with multiple partygoers. He pulled out a firearm and shot at several people, including Jimenez Santos's father, before fleeing. A group from the house party chased the gunman down the street, at which point he turned around and fired at them. A 32-year-old friend of the Jimenez Santos family was shot and killed. In response, the partygoers started pelting the gunman with stone pavers, which they'd grabbed from a nearby pile. The shooter collapsed under the barrage of stones and bricks, sustaining critical injuries to which he succumbed at the scene. In a subsequent media interview, Jimenez Santos expressed frustration that she'd been put on hold during her 911 call a consequence of Fort Worth emergency call centers being severely understaffed. No charges have yet been leveled against her and others in the group that fatally pelted the gunman, but mob justice and vigilantism is punishable under the state's law. Number 7. Faster Horses Incident In July of 2021, three young men were found dead in a camping trailer 
while attending the Faster Horses Music Festival in Michigan. The event, which takes place at the Michigan International Speedway, is also known as the three-day hillbilly sleepover, as most festival goers will typically camp in and around the racetrack. After a concerned friend of the group had called the emergency services, first responders arrived at the scene and opened the camping trailer to find five men, all of whom were unconscious. Dawson Brown and Richie Mays II, both aged 20, were pronounced dead at the scene, as was 19-year-old Cole Sova. All three were Michigan Center High School graduates who'd played on the same football team. 20-year-olds Rayfield Johnson and Curtis Stitt were taken to the hospital in critical condition but ultimately survived in what Lenawee County Sheriff Troy Bevier deemed to have been an absolutely tragic event. It was determined that the men had suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning. They hadn't properly stored a generator they'd been using, which resulted in them inhaling the deadly fumes. In the aftermath, Sheriff Bevier issued a warning to people using generators, urging them to make sure such devices were kept in a well-ventilated area. Number 6. Michaela Hostetler After she'd attended the 2018 edition of the Faster Horses Festival in Michigan, a young woman was fatally struck by an SUV. On July the 23rd, Michaela Hostetler, aged 19, was walking on the shoulder of the road near the Michigan International Speedway alongside her boyfriend, 21-year-old Colin Campbell. Even though the festival had just ended, a number of attendees were reportedly heading to after-parties. Shortly after 4 a.m., 17-year-old Jose Mora was driving his 2005 Chevrolet Trailblazer north on Brooklyn Highway. By his account, Mora glanced at his gear shift and only peripherally spotted the couple before plowing into them. He denied that he'd been looking at his phone prior to the collision, although a test revealed it had been used seven times between 4.10 and 4.20 a.m., a timeline corresponding to that in which the accident was suspected to have occurred. Hostetler sustained mortal injuries while Campbell was left in critical condition. He had no recollection of the crash after sustaining traumatic brain injuries for which he spent considerable time at an inpatient rehabilitation center. There were no charges filed against Mora as prosecutors deemed there wasn't enough evidence to pursue a criminal case. At the time of the accident, he was under the limit for alcohol consumption and there was no irrefutable indication of moving violations or distracted driving. Number 5. Luella Fletcher Mitchie An hour before her 25th birthday on September the 10th of 2017, a woman died in the woods at the edge of the Bestival Music Festival in Dorset, England. Luella Fletcher Mitchie, daughter of Scottish film and television actor John Mitchie, was attending the festival with her boyfriend, Sion Brufton, aged 28. The aspiring rapper had reportedly procured the recreational drug 2CP, classified as a Class A substance, and given it to Fletcher Mitchie. He then filmed her over a period of six hours as she began to hallucinate on the drug and beg for help, leading up to her death. At various moments in the harrowing footage, Fletcher Mitchie tried eating thorns and had begun to slap herself in an evident state of confusion, with Brufton at one point calling her a drama queen. In spite of her being in distress, Brufton didn't take her to the festival's hospital tent, even though they were only several hundred yards from it. Prosecutors would later argue that it was because he feared repercussions, stemming from a suspended prison sentence he'd been given about a month prior. Fletcher Mitchie began shouting for her parents and eventually talked to them on the phone. They immediately began the 120-mile drive from London to Dorset but unfortunately arrived too late to find her alive. It was subsequently argued that she was already dead at Brufton's feet in the last video he'd taken of her. He was arrested but defended his actions by claiming that he didn't want to leave Fletcher Mitchie alone in the woods to get help and that he only thought she was having a bad trip. He was found guilty of manslaughter by gross negligence in February of 2019. His eight and a half year prison sentence was overturned on appeal and only a drug charge remained. As a judge determined, prosecutors had failed to prove that Fletcher Mitchie would have survived had she received help. Number 4. Isabella Simetta Texas teenager Isabella Simetta suffered a fatal gunshot wound to her abdomen while at a renaissance fair on October the 25th of 2020. The authorities responded to reports of a disturbance at the Texas Renaissance Festival campgrounds in Todd Mission at around 2.40 a.m. 
19-year-old Simetta and Sean Campbell, aged 22, were acquaintances who'd traveled to the festival along with other friends. Another attendee, Mitchell Heasley, told investigators that he and Simetta had gotten into an argument. Campbell then intervened and put a gun to Heasley's head. According to a probable cause affidavit, an altercation ensued with the former attempting to disarm Campbell. During the struggle, the weapon discharged and a round struck Simetta, who later passed away. Campbell fled the scene but was later found in a car with a six-hour 9mm handgun in the glove compartment. He admitted to firing the shot that killed Simetta and was held at Grimes County Jail on two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Number 3. Astro World Crush On November the 5th of 2021, a massive human crush occurred at the Energy Park in Houston, Texas. During a performance by rapper Travis Scott, on the first day of the Astro World Festival. Eight people died on the night of the concert and two more passed away from their injuries over the following days, while at least 25 were hospitalized. Live Nation, along with its affiliates, operated and managed the disastrous event, which was also streamed live by Apple Music. Since the morning hours before the scheduled opening, groups had begun breaching checkpoints and flooding the venue. As noted by the Houston Police Department, volatile crowd behavior continued into the evening with hundreds being treated at the festival's aid stations. There was no act on the festival's second stage, therefore the estimated 50,000 in attendance all assembled outside the main stage to watch Scott, who was also the festival's founder, as he began his performance at 9.02 p.m. Houston Fire Chief Sam Pena would later tell the media that the crowd began to compress towards the front of the stage, while also surging from the sides and the concert rapidly devolved into chaos. Concert goers began falling and trampling over each other. Multiple sources, including forensic analysis and video evidence, indicated that at least one attendee was fatally crushed under a mass of people right at the concert's onset, with no evidence he ever got up again. Ten minutes into Scott's performance, a tightly packed group of fans in the crowd's southern quadrant began screaming for help. Those who died or suffered critical injuries are believed to have suffered compressive asphyxiation after being forced into as little as 1.85 square feet of space per person. Medical personnel couldn't reach those in need as piles of fans were nearly two-person deep in some areas. In the pandemonium, there were instances of unconscious fans being crowd-surfed to safety. Many had started chanting for the show to be stopped while one woman was filmed climbing a ladder to the media tower and pleading for help from camera operators. A man joined her shouting, people are dying, while elsewhere in the crowd fans had started dancing on top of ambulances, fruitlessly trying to get through. Scott had paused his performance a total of three times throughout, once to report that someone had passed out, but continued singing after each one, encouraging more fervent reactions from his fans. The concert ended at 10.12 and gained widespread notoriety in the aftermath. The investigation is ongoing, but a number of lawsuits have already been launched against Scott and the festival's operators. While there had been considerable problems with the festival's overall organization, the rapper himself was also heavily criticized for not stopping the concert or attempting to better control the crowd. Number 2. Alexandra Ross King In January of 2019, a young Australian woman died of an MDMA overdose at the FOMO Music Festival in Parramatta Park. While heading to the event, 19-year-old Alexandra Ross King and her friends had stopped in Gosford, where they bought drugs from a local dealer. They then took a bus to the festival held in the western part of Sydney. Because drinks at the event were so expensive, the group decided to arrive already drunk and consumed juice mixed with vodka on the way. In about half an hour, Ross King took roughly three quarters of an MDMA capsule which she washed down with alcohol. Before entering the FOMO festival, she ingested two more capsules at once, nervous that the police might find the drugs on her. She spent the next few hours dancing as temperatures climbed up to 95 degrees Fahrenheit and drinking vodka mixed with Red Bull. She then began to feel unwell and her friends helped her to a medical tent where she began to suffer from muscle spasms, high fever, and irregular breathing. The teenager was rushed to Westmead Hospital where she suffered multiple cardiac arrests and ultimately passed away. Two unnamed men aged 20 and 23 were arrested in the aftermath by Gosford police for indirectly supplying the drugs that had claimed Ross King's life. Number 1. 
Mawazin Stampede. Shortly after midnight on May the 24th of 2009, a deadly stampede occurred at a soccer stadium in Rabat, Morocco, during the Mawazin International Music Festival. A free concert by pop star Abdelaziz Stati had begun later than billed, allowing festival attendees who'd finished concerts at other locations to make their way to the Hay Nada Stadium. The stampede occurred towards the end of the performance, when many of the 70,000 in attendance tried to leave the stadium at the same time. A wire fence collapsed as the enormous mass of people began overflowing out of the venue. Eleven concert goers died, with their bodies only discovered after the stampede had ended, and at least as many were hospitalized. Rescuers subsequently had to pull survivors from the wreckage. The governor of Rabat at the time blamed the tragedy on the concert goers, claiming they decided to go over the metal barriers to have a quick exit. However, survivors questioned why the exits had been shut, even though it was a free concert, and why the police officers at the scene, which numbered close to 3,000, hadn't intervened when the incident had become serious. King Mohammed VI extended his condolences to the victims' families and offered to pay for funeral and hospital costs. Number 8. GNU's Final Show The police in Prince George's County, Maryland, were called to the scene of a reported shooting on the evening of March the 18th of 2022. Upon their arrival, officers came upon a male victim identified as rapper GNU, who was in critical condition after suffering a gunshot wound. He was pronounced dead at a local hospital a few hours later. Shortly after 24-year-old Gnu's passing, it was reported that a funeral was to be held at the Bliss nightclub in Washington, D.C. On the day of the memorial service, footage from inside the venue went viral on social media. Part of the arrangements meant to honor the deceased rapper involved having his embalmed corpse propped up on the dance floor overlooking the crowd. The macabre funeral subsequently faced heavy criticism from the general public, with many calling the presentation of the man's body sick and disturbing. The nightclub itself released a statement in the wake of the incident, claiming they hadn't been aware of the bizarre tribute ahead of time and apologized to anyone who was offended. Number 7. Nicole Flanagan the lifeless body of a high-end New York City escort was found inside a 55-gallon barrel in Ridgefield Park, New Jersey, on August 13th of 2021. The authorities had been alerted to the large plastic drum after local residents had complained of a repulsive smell emanating from it. The woman was identified as 42-year-old Nicole Flanagan, who'd last been seen alive on August 6th. Surveillance cameras at a financial district apartment building had captured her in an elevator with Aquio Parker, an alleged member of New York City's notorious Snow Gang. Five days later, security footage showed Parker bringing the barrel in which Flanagan was later found into the building. The following day, he and an unidentified accomplice were spotted wheeling the container into the back of a U-Haul van and driving away from the apartment building. Although Flanagan's body showed no visible signs of physical trauma, a warrant for Parker's arrest was issued and he ultimately surrendered to the authorities. He was charged with being an accomplice to disturbing, moving, and or concealing human remains. As of the case's latest updates, investigators had theorized that Flanagan had fatally overdosed during her time in Parker's apartment. Rather than call the emergency services or render aid to the escort himself, however, the man had allegedly opted to dispose of her body. Number 6. Christy Giles and Hilda Marcella Cabreles Arzola. On November the 13th of 2021, two masked men driving a black sedan with no license plates dropped an unconscious woman off outside Southern California Hospital in Culver City. A short time later, the duo drove to Kaiser Permanente West Los Angeles Hospital, where they abandoned a second unresponsive woman on the sidewalk. The first patient, who was identified as 24-year-old Christy Giles, was pronounced dead shortly after her arrival. The second, a friend of Giles's named Hilda Marcela Cabreles Arzola, was kept in critical condition at the hospital until her eventual death 11 days later on November the 24th. According to an official report released by the Los Angeles Police Department, the victims were believed to have been given a myriad of illegal substances that ultimately led to them fatally overdosing. The following month, the LAPD placed three men named as David Pierce, Michael Ansbach, 
and Brant Osborne under arrest. Pierce was charged with manslaughter in connection to the two women's deaths, while the latter two faced charges of accessory to manslaughter. As the investigation progressed, detectives gathered that, during a night out at various clubs, the victims had been lured to Pierce's apartment in the 8600 block of Olympic Boulevard, where the three suspects provided them with a cocktail of drugs that caused them to fall unconscious. Rather than contact emergency services, however, Pierce removed the license plates on his vehicle and called upon his two accomplices to help him discard the women's bodies outside the hospitals. It subsequently emerged that Pierce, a film producer from Beverly Hills, was also being charged with assault in connection to an unrelated case involving four alleged victims. The man pleaded not guilty to the various offenses of which he was accused as he awaited the commencement of his criminal trial. Number 5. Tequila Gross 30-year-old Tequila Gross was gunned down near a club in Marshall County, Mississippi, in the early morning hours of April the 24th of 2022. According to the county sheriff's office, the pregnant mother of two had been spending the night out with friends when the fatal incident occurred at roughly 2.30 a.m. Around that time, a gunfight erupted between several individuals outside Roosevelt's club on Highway 309 South. Gross, who was sitting in a parked vehicle nearby, was struck in the head by a stray bullet. Initially, the driver of the car reportedly thought the woman was having a seizure, but then quickly realized that she'd suffered a critical gunshot wound, by which time it was already too late to render aid. The man who'd inadvertently killed her fled the scene, but within hours, he was identified by the authorities as 38-year-old Andre Norman, whom Gross had never met. The police tracked Norman down later on the day of the incident and took him into custody on a charge of first-degree murder. He was subsequently held in county jail on a $1 million bond, pending the commencement of his case's legal proceedings. Number 4. Jessica Lally in October of 2021, a woman from South Yorkshire, England, was spending a night out with friends at Broncos Rodeo, an American-themed bar and restaurant in Sheffield. According to subsequent reports, 26-year-old Jessica Lally became unresponsive after falling off a mechanical bull set up in-house at the restaurant. Although she'd reportedly fallen onto a padded area, she then went into cardiac arrest and, shortly thereafter, passed away. The tragic incident wasn't caused by the mechanical bull itself, According to the findings of a subsequent investigation, the general manager of the establishment detailed that the machine had been moving at the lowest speed setting when Lally fell and lost consciousness. It was thus determined that the young woman's heart attack had been completely unrelated to any external factors, including the force with which she'd impacted the ground. Lally, a manager at a jewelry store in Rotherham, was reportedly in the process of planning her wedding at the time of her abrupt death. Number 3. The Blue Lantern Club Stampede On the evening of October the 8th of 2018, dozens were injured in a stampede outside the Blue Lantern Club in the town of Corinaldo, central Italy. Subsequent reports indicated that the nightclub had been occupied by more than a thousand people who were there to watch a live performance by rapper Safira Ebasta. According to a statement by the local fire service, the crowd had been sent into a full-blown panic following the dispersal of a stinging substance, likely pepper spray. Clubgoers ran for the emergency exits and consequently trampled over each other. The force of the fleeing crowd ultimately caused the railing to collapse onto a concentrated mass of people, six of whom passed away and nearly 200 others who were left injured. In August of 2019, the BBC reported that Italian authorities had taken seven men into custody on manslaughter charges in connection to the fatal stampede. On the night of the concert, the suspects had allegedly been using pepper spray to rob people, a course of action determined to have been the initial cause of the panic. The police also stated that there had been about 1,400 attendees gathered in the club that night, in spite of the venue's reported maximum capacity being less than 900 people. Number 2. The Shooting of Kazmira Nash in the early morning hours of May the 1st of 2021, police in Louisville, Kentucky, received reports of shots fired at the Vibes restaurant and Ultra Loud in the 1300 block of River Road. When responding officers arrived at the scene, they reportedly found a man and woman suffering from apparent gunshot wounds. The female victim, who was identified as a bartender at the nightclub called Kazmira Nash, was pronounced dead at the scene. 
the man was transported to University of Louisville Hospital with what were described as non-life-threatening injuries. The Louisville Metro Police Department subsequently reported that at the time of the deadly incident, the venue had been well attended due to it having occurred on the same weekend as the Kentucky Derby. Investigators quickly identified Ronnie O'Bannon, the longtime DJ for prominent rapper Jack Harlow, as the primary person of interest in Nash's shooting. Less than a year prior to the latter incident, O'Bannon had allegedly shot and killed Nash's cousin, Torre Four, following an altercation at the exclusive nightclub in Shively. On the night of her death, Nash had confronted O'Bannon, who ultimately gunned her down in the middle of the crowded club. In December of 2021, Nash's family filed a lawsuit against the owners of Vibes Restaurant and Ultra Lounge, claiming that they'd failed to secure the venue by negligently allowing certain attendees to bypass the security screening required for all others. As of the latest updates on the case, O'Bannon's defense team had requested he be granted immunity from prosecution, arguing that he'd acted in self-defense on the night of the fatal shooting. Number 1. Connor Hayes 20-year-old Connor Hayes got into an altercation with a club bouncer during a night out with friends on March the 8th of 2017. The young man had been attempting to negotiate the re-entry of a companion who had briefly left the Spenceley's Emporium in North Yorkshire, England. A cell phone video taken by an eyewitness showed Hayes pleading his case to the security worker at about 12.45 a.m. Then seemingly out of nowhere, the latter punched and knocked him unconscious. Hayes' friend came to his defense, but he too was viciously struck by the bad-tempered bouncer. It was reported that Hayes, an employee at a Papa John's location on Linthorpe Road, Middlesbrough, required hospitalization to repair the badly broken nose inflicted by the bouncer. When speaking to reporters in the incident's aftermath, the young man described how his friend had left the club to get some money, but was stopped at the door upon his return. He'd attempted to explain the situation, but the club worker became increasingly agitated until he eventually lashed out in violence. Subsequent reports indicated that local police had opened an investigation into the matter to determine whether criminal charges were warranted. Number 6. Emet Sanguien After celebrating her upcoming 24th birthday with family in Florida in February of 2006, Emet Sanguien flew to New York City, where she went clubbing with her best friend, Claire Higgins. At some point during their night out on February the 25th, the two young women argued about going home. Higgins left, but Sanguien decided to stay out, later calling her friend to say she'd soon be heading home as well. She was last seen at an establishment called The Falls at around 4 a.m. Roughly 17 hours later, Brooklyn police received an anonymous phone call alerting them that a woman's body had been found in Spring Creek Park. The victim was subsequently identified as Sanguien, and an autopsy revealed that she'd been beaten, abused, and asphyxiated. Her unclothed body was found wrapped in a comforter, with her hands and feet bound, her head covered in packaging tape, and a sock pushed down her throat. Sanguien's broken fingernails indicated that she tried to fend off her attacker before she was eventually overpowered. Daryl Littlejohn, one of the bouncers at the Falls, was initially taken into the custody of the NYPD on a parole violation. He'd spent 12 years in prison on a robbery and drug possession charges, and working nights at the club went against the curfew stipulations of his release. The bouncer had been asked to escort Sanguien out of the club, come closing time, and was later spotted talking to her in front of the establishment. Little John's DNA, most likely from a nosebleed that had occurred during the struggle, was collected from the bindings used to restrain Sanguien. Additionally, cell phone tower records placed him at the time and location of the murder. As his van was featured in the news reports that followed, it was recognized by a Queenswoman who reported the bouncer had tried to abduct her in October of 2005. College student Shania Woodward testified that Little John had approached her dressed as a police officer, handcuffed her, and forced her in the vehicle. Fortunately, she was able to escape. Little John was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison for Woodward's attempted abduction and to life 
for Sang Yen's murder, with the sentences to run consecutively. The Falls lost its liquor license in June of 2006, amidst protests triggered by the revelation that manager Daniel Dorian had lied to investigators about seeing Sang Yen inside the club prior to her murder. Number 5. India Chip Chase In late January of 2016, British woman India Chip Chase, aged 20, was outside a nightclub in Northampton, England. Chip Chase, later determined to have been three times over the drink drive limit, was upset and had repeatedly told a bouncer at the club that she only wanted to go home. The man had led her to a taxi, but she got out of the vehicle when asked to pay the fear in advance. CCTV footage would capture 52-year-old Edward Tenniswood approaching Chip Chase as she leaned against the club's wall and looked into her phone. He put his arm around her in what was described as a paternal way and a witness overheard him promising to get the woman home safely. The pair then got a taxi and Tenniswood took Chip Chase to his terraced house on Stanley Road, where he reportedly lived in squalor with nearly every inch of the floors covered in newspapers. The authorities would later trace the signal from Chip Chase's phone to the address, where they found her dead from strangulation on January the 31st. Leading up to her death, the young woman had been abused and assaulted, with over 30 injuries covering her body. Tenniswood was arrested at a hotel where, upon encountering the officers, he expressed surprise they'd located him so quickly, adding, I suppose you've been to the house. You've found what you're looking for. During his ensuing trial, he would maintain that he and Chip Chase had had consensual relations and that he'd strangled her to death as a result of his over-eagerness in bed. Tenniswood then described cuddling with the body, believing that the woman was in a deep sleep before leaving the house and covering her with a sheet. Scratches were, however, found on his neck and arm while his blood was recovered from under the victim's fingernails, indicating that a struggle had occurred. It took a jury less than two hours to convict him at Birmingham Crown Court. Following a two-week trial, he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years served. Number 4. Adeline Guerrero 22-year-old Adeline Guerrero was involved in successive altercations, one of which ended in her being arrested and charged with assaulting a police officer outside Pasadena's Bam Bam Club. A processing photo of Guerrero showing her with mud on her face from the brawls was later released online. The incident occurred in March of 2018 when a fight between her and another woman, which had begun in the club, continued in the parking lot even after the arrival of law enforcement. The other woman had tried to walk away, but Guerrero was still holding on to her hair. After the police managed to release her grip, she reportedly turned her aggression towards them. A video captured by a witness and subsequently shared on social media showed a violent interaction between Guerrero and one of the officers. The man aggressively pushed her into a vehicle from which Guerrero bounced back and pushed him in return. The officer then grabbed the woman by the throat and dragged her to the ground, where he continued forcing his hands into or around her face and neck as he was seemingly attempting to restrain her. Guerrero was arrested while the Pasadena Police Department subsequently determined the officer had acted within his authority and didn't suspend or place him on leave. Number 3. Brittany Stevens in early August of 2019, at the Scene nightclub in Augusta, Georgia, a 24-year-old woman was viciously beaten by two assailants. Earlier in the evening, Brittany Stevens had gotten into a verbal altercation with 21-year-old Holly Carter. Some reports indicated that Carter and her friend Jordy Holt, also 21, had been following Stevens around the club trying to pick a fight with her after she'd been seen talking to Carter's ex-boyfriend. Once they were outside, Stevens attempted to climb over a railing in an alley adjacent to the club in an attempt to avoid the two women, who'd begun yelling and cursing at her. Carter and Holt then charged Stevens, punching and kicking her repeatedly while also threatening to kill her. Stevens was taken to a local hospital with severe injuries to her face, including two large cuts resulting in permanent scars and a fractured left eye socket that required the insertion of a metal plate to mend. She subsequently suffered from nerve damage and impaired vision. Carter and Holt, both of whom didn't have a criminal history, were arrested on charges of aggravated battery. A judge granted them a bond of $50,000 on the condition that they didn't have any contact with the victim, consume alcohol, go to nightclubs, nor use social media 
and respect a curfew of 9 p.m. 40-year-old Michael Gordon, who'd been at the scene of the attack, was also arrested and indicted for lying to investigators. He'd initially told them that a black man had run up and struck Stevens in the head with his knee, knowing the statement wasn't true. Number 2. Tiffany Aaron Police in Anniston, Alabama, responded to reports of a shooting at a nightclub in the 1800 block of South Quinto Avenue in the early hours of January the 16th of 2022. When officers arrived at the scene, they found 36-year-old Tiffany Aaron in critical condition inside the Pure Sports Bar and Grill after she'd sustained gunshot wounds to the head. An ambulance rushed her to the Northeast Alabama Regional Medical Center, where she was reportedly pronounced dead on arrival. Aniston police launched an investigation, the preliminary findings of which indicated that there'd been an exchange of gunfire between Aaron and the nightclub security staff. The woman's sister, however, expressed doubts regarding the initial reports, describing her as one of the kindest people you would meet and emphasizing that she wasn't a violent person. No arrests had been made as of the latest updates on the matter, as the police were still reviewing footage from the nightclub to determine the sequence of events that had led to Aaron's death. Number 1. Lauren McLennan Two women were involved in a fatal altercation in August of 2016 at one of the best-known night spots in the city of Vancouver, Canada. On the 11th of the month, 28-year-old Lauren McLennan and Samantha Nadine Doolan, aged 29, were both at the Caprice nightclub along the Granville Strip. The women had initially gotten into a fight about the washroom lineup before the brawl spilled into the street. It was there that Doolan then punched McLennan in the face, causing her to drop to the ground. Doolan continued the assault, reportedly kicking the other woman in the head before a bouncer pulled her off. She fled the Granville Strip in a taxi and was arrested shortly thereafter while McClellan succumbed to head trauma in a hospital the following day. Doolan pleaded guilty to manslaughter in July of 2017 and the following year was sentenced to spend two years in prison and given three years probation. She was also forbidden to own firearms for 10 years. Her sentence was pronounced only days after in an unrelated report the Caprice nightclub had announced that it will be permanently closing down. Uh, even though like uh, it felt like I wasn't doing this physically, I was still able to see everything, and I would like see them moving, and like I just kept firing until like they stopped moving, and I'd like aim at the head and whatnot. Less than an hour before the new year, on December the 31st of 2017, New Jersey teenager Scott Kologi called his mother, 44-year-old Linda, up to his room at their New Jersey home. As later reported by his family, Scott suffered from severe developmental disabilities. Even though he was in his late teens, he often slept in bed with his parents, believed in Santa Claus and needed his mother to dress him. He was also autistic and a suspected schizophrenia sufferer. On New Year's Eve, Linda entered his room to find that all the lights had been turned off. Moments later, Scott shot her dead, several times in the head with a high-powered rifle. His father, 42-year-old Stephen, rushed upstairs after hearing the shots ring out. Scott fatally shot him in the back and torso. The teenager, who at the time was reportedly wearing earplugs to drown out the sound of gunfire, made his way downstairs. He shot and killed his grandfather's girlfriend, 70-year-old Mary Schultz, whom he and his siblings called Grandmother Mary. The final victim of Scott's spree was his 18-year-old sister, Brittany, who was home for the holidays after her first semester of college. Scott shot her in the head at close range as she sat at the kitchen table. His brother, Stephen Jr., who legally owned the rifle used in the massacre, escaped the Jersey Shore home unharmed, as did his grandfather, Adrian. Scott was subsequently arrested at the scene. Stephen Jr. acted as his legal guardian and struggled to maintain his composure as Scott confessed to the spree upon being questioned by law enforcement. In the video recorded interview, Scott calmly explained the circumstances of each killing, saying, I just kept firing until they, like, stopped moving, and adding, it felt like I was watching it, like I was further back in my mind. Scott was trialed as an adult in the legal proceedings that followed, during which his defense argued that he was criminally insane at the time of the killings. In contrast, the prosecution called them acts of evil, of which Scott was fully aware, as he'd even researched beforehand if the weapon he was using would be effective against the bulletproof vests of responding police. 
He was ultimately sentenced to 150 years in prison after he was convicted on four counts of first degree murder and a second degree weapons charge. Number seven, Tyra D'Amica McGriff. On New Year's Day, 2018, two women were involved in a fatal confrontation outside of a BP gas station in Jacksonville, Florida. At around 10.30 p.m., 24-year-old Sahara Barkley left her Chevrolet running as she headed into the store. Simultaneously, Shantez Edmondson and Tyra D'Amica McGriff, both in their early 20s, got out of another vehicle. As shown by surveillance footage, the former stole Barkley's vehicle and drove off. In the moments that followed, Barkley, a mother of one who was pregnant with her second child, confronted McGriff and accused her of being an accomplice to the theft. She punched her, at which point McGriff brandished a firearm and shot her dead. Law enforcement identified the gunwoman through the surveillance footage and arrested her a few days later. She was found guilty of manslaughter and carrying a concealed weapon for which she was sentenced to 21 years in prison. Edmondson was also arrested during a traffic stop in April of 2018 and ultimately sentenced to 10 years in prison for his role in Barclay's death. Number six, Barry Walsh. 52-year-old Australian man Barry Walsh was spending New Year's 2017 partying with friends on Budge Boy Beach in New South Wales. A few hours into the new year, the father of two decided to try out a firework he'd reportedly been saving for roughly a decade. Walsh, a rugby player and surfing enthusiast, went to light it as his wife, Joe watched him from about 100 feet away. Within seconds, the firework malfunctioned and exploded in Walsh's face, inflicting severe head injuries. Friends called the emergency services and attempted CPR on Walsh until the police and paramedics arrived at the scene, but he ultimately succumbed to his injuries. Joe, who was inconsolably distraught upon witnessing her husband's death, was sedated and transported to Wyong Hospital for a short time. Number 5. Osman Shaptafaj On the morning of New Year's Eve 2019, Australian couple Vetan and Lindita Musai returned to their family's home in the Melbourne suburb of Yarraville after celebrating their first wedding anniversary. After they removed their bags from an Uber, they were ambushed by Lindita's estranged father, 55-year-old Osman Shaptafaj. He shot them both in the back of the head with a handgun as they stood at the front door. Family members opened the door to find the young couple in critical condition and Shaptafaj with a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber handgun to his own head, but he decided not to pull the trigger then and there. 25-year-old Lindita died at the scene in spite of her family's desperate attempts to revive her, while 29-year-old Vetan passed away in a local hospital the following day. Shaptafaj had resented his daughter and his ex-wife for what he'd perceived as them cutting him off from the family. His violent and controlling behavior had led to the end of his marriage in 2008, after which his estranged wife, son and daughter took out intervention orders against him. He'd at one point sent his ex his own severed finger, as well as assaulted and threatened his daughter for choosing to live with her mother. Shaptafaj was enraged upon learning about Lindita's wedding months after it had taken place. He also felt disrespected by Vetan for not asking for his permission to marry her. In 2021, Shaptafaj pleaded guilty and was subsequently sentenced to at least 35 years in prison for a double murder that a judge noted almost defied belief. Number 4. Yvonne Raquel Ramirez Texas residents Josh McKinney and Yvonne Raquel Ramirez, both aged 19, had been spending time together leading up to New Year's Eve 2017 when they went out together. According to the police, before leaving her date's Baytown home, Ramirez stole his guns and later asked him for $2,000 to get them back. McKinney, who'd been training to become a Marine, reportedly sent the young woman photos of the money he'd gathered, and she agreed to meet him on Mizell Street in Harris County. An unnamed friend of McKinney's went to the spot with him at around 4.30 a.m. and remembered him saying he wasn't going to get robbed again. The witness will report seeing McKinney holding a gun to Ramirez's head after he'd placed her in a neck hold. The witness went to call 911 and upon returning to the scene found that Ramirez had fatally shot McKinney. She was taken to the hospital with a gunshot wound to the shoulder but survived and was charged with murder. Ramirez maintained that she'd shot the man in self-defense. 
She told the police that she and McKinney had been consuming illicit substances and that at some point he'd accused her of stealing his guns, which she denied. They then got into the fight that the witness had reported. Ramirez initially claimed that the pistol had discharged and struck McKinney after it had fallen to the ground. She then admitted that as they grappled, she'd taken the weapon from him and used it to shoot him dead. Another witness reported seeing the woman manipulate McKinney's body and blood analysis indicated that she'd removed his wallet as he was dying. Number 3. Reese Hancock On New Year's Day 2020, British man Reese Hancock had a cup of tea with his mother at a home in Etwall, Derbyshire, England. He would later be regarded as his way of saying farewell as he knew that he'd be going to prison for a long time. He spoke to his mother about his plans of killing his estranged wife, 39-year-old Helen, after recently finding out she'd started seeing another man. Reese and Helen had three children together whom the latter had taken to her parents' house so that she could spend New Year's with her boyfriend, Martin Griffiths, aged 48. Reese took two kitchen knives with him and his mother's landline phones to prevent her from alerting the authorities. He couldn't find her cell phone, however, and the woman called the police, urging officers to rush over to Hancock's former marital home in Duffield. By then, 39-year-old Reese had already made his way to the address. He viciously attacked Helen and Martin, slashing and stabbing them repeatedly with the knives. By the time his onslaught was over, he'd inflicted 66 wounds to his wife and 37 to her new partner. Helen, who'd separated from Reese a few months prior, was stabbed with such force that the knife handle reportedly went into her stomach. Reese then called the police to say, I've just murdered my wife in her bed. Officers arrived and found him covered in blood inside the property, at which point he told them, I'm hardly going to deny it, look at me. The victims were pronounced dead at the scene, which was described by an ambulance worker as the most violent they'd seen in 17 years on the job. Reese subsequently pleaded guilty to the double homicide and was jailed for a minimum of 31 years. Number 2. Nigeria Jerome White Pennsylvania man Nigeria Jerome White was convicted in August of 2022 of a first-degree murder that had occurred two years prior on New Year's Eve. 29-year-old White had waived his right to a jury trial and opted for a Delaware County judge to act as the sole decider of his case. Leading up to his death, 36-year-old Rashid Bundy had been attending a New Year's Eve party at his family's home in Norristown. White had dated his sister, and Bundy had reportedly confronted him in a breezeway over the manner in which he treated her during their turbulent relationship. Gunfire erupted in the breezeway within less than a minute of the two men meeting up. Bundy was fatally shot in the head and White sustained a gunshot wound to the neck with the bullets coming from the same weapon. White's defense would maintain that he'd been a victim in a hit meant for Bundy carried out by a third party. The prosecution argued that White had actually been the gunman and that he'd been wounded in the neck by his own bullet that had ricocheted off a wall. A pizza delivery man would report hearing someone screaming, Nice shot my brother, before identifying White as the person who then ran past him and fled from the vehicle. The prosecution also noted that White hadn't behaved like a victim but like a murderer, as he hadn't contacted the authorities in the shooting's aftermath. He remained on the run before U.S. Marshals apprehended him in Philadelphia in March of 2021. After being found guilty, White faced a mandatory sentence of life in prison. Number 1. Temple Stampede On New Year's Day 2022, a large crowd of pilgrims had gathered at the Mata Vashnav Devi Shrine in the town of Katra, India. They trekked through hills to reach the temple, which was one of the most visited in the country's north. An argument broke out between a group of youths in the tightly packed crowd near one of the gates where devotees entered and exited the route to the shrine. A stampede ensued at around 2.40 a.m. Dramatic footage from the scene showed several men climbing and clinging onto scaffolding, desperate to escape the crush. A pilgrim, who only gave his name as Mahesh, survived the incident after initially finding himself under a mass of people. He later told a media outlet, I saw people moving over the bodies. It was a horrifying sight. Mahesh added that he was able to help in rescuing others caught in the stampede. Police were called to the scene and restored order, but by then at least 12 people had lost their lives and 17 others had suffered serious injuries. Thanks for watching. Would you rather only be rude or only be nice? Let us know in the comments section below.